experience increases trust. One of the um, most common complaints at Harvard was my internet is down. What did you do to my internet? Like, no, it's not your internet. It, but it shows a very clear model that the internet that I go to is safe and it's trustworthy. Again, we need do not trust signals. Now, it turns out that users are really bad security managers. In fact, not only do we not have do not trust signals, we have trust signals, and then you're supposed to notice that it's not there if and learn not to trust, right? It's like, do you notice that I'm not wearing a hat? Would you notice that if I were not wearing glasses? Humans are not very good at that. Um, so, it, you know, you want it to be a default, and there are pretty much two ways to do this. You can educate all net users to behave the way we think they ought to, or you can assume they are. Computer security is built for machines, and another example, passwords. Here's your basic rule of passwords. Think of something you can't remember. <laughs> Don't write it down. Who can't, this is not a human design. So SSL, two categories, secure and not secure. If you have the ability to draw a little box over the little tiny, tiny, tiny red warning sign, you can look secure. And there has been one documented case of SSL-enabled SSL -enabled phishing. How did that happen? Somebody went to VeriSign and paid them money. Shockingly enough, VeriSign gave them a key. And then look at something like, um, you guys know pretty, the P3P, the platform for privacy preferences, where a vendor asserts, this is what I'll do. I promise I'll respect your privacy. Well, what if the vendor's lying? It turned, I mean, I suspect that if phishing sites had privacy policies, they'd be pretty good. You don't want other people stealing those credit cards. You've just gone to all that trouble to steal, do you? That's work. Okay. It also assumes one standard for all transactions. PGP, all right, I trust you. You tell me to trust these guys. This is what I call the Sandra D problem. Anybody watch, you know, the movie Grease? Okay. So she comes in. I, I personally don't like that movie because she comes in and she's like headed for a scholarship at university, but she meets Eugene, and so she meets all of Eugene's friends. And so she ends up deciding she's not going to go to college. She's going to have life, you know, wearing leather at the bowling alley instead, right? So maybe I just see this too much like a parent. But that is a problem that she met one person in the network, so she met all these bad people in the network that trust distinguishes. So you introduce me to everybody in class, and then you introduce me to a whole other set of people. It turns out later that you're not trustworthy. That doesn't get backed out in the web of trust. There's not a path dependency. Key revocation, another example, great example. This is um, oh, there, your verifier. She was talking about you have different levels of revocation in your verifier. It makes a difference if somebody's credit card is stolen, if it expires, or if when they showed up it was stolen to begin with. There are different kinds of revocation. All right. So I've argued human trust is an important element of computer security design. One, that's the first thing I've argued here. Two, that computer security currently is built in a way that is in opposition to human trust behaviors. So everybody is with me now. OK. What are we going to do? What should we do? One, we get computers to do what computers are good at. What are computers good at? They're good at processing data, storing data, transmitting data, and distinguishing between very different types of failures. What are humans good at? We're very good at understanding context. We're good at lumping behaviors, right? We can evaluate uncertainty, maybe not with the level of detail a computer can evaluate uncertainty mathematically, but 
human beings are fairly good at order of magnitude risk evaluations. Incidentally, especially the demographic of college students, graduate students, as you get older, you start overestimating risk. But at your age, you're very good at esti statistically speaking. So let's start with humans. So what do humans have with trust? We have pre-existing social capital. We have a tendency to trust each other. We have social networks, networks of friends, right? That's what I want to talk about building on. So the first thing is we have to think about, well, what, what do we want to build for users? We have to have a meaningful signal if we want to build this for users. So it turns out we're not even talking to users. Right? So identity theft. Identity theft worries many people, and reasonably so. It's unauthorized use of authenticating information to assert identity in the financial name space. I'm just saying that's a good, solid definition. That's not what we call it in security. Choice Point had an internal process violation. They accidentally faxed 145,000 records to Kinko's. I think this is some kind of achievement, actually. And, <laughs> and they didn't notice it was the Kinko's, and that it wasn't a real business. In fact, they didn't notice that the six businesses they thought they were faxing to all had as their office the Kinko's. So it was, you'll be relieved to know, a violation of their own internal process that says we do not fax huge chunks of information to Kinko's. In Berkeley, there was a security violation. There was, this is a process violation, right? We know these are different. A process violation is different from a security violation, which is different from a confidentiality problem. Bank of America, right, backup data 1.2 million records because they lost their backup data and they, don't, they did not at this time encrypt their backup data, right? This is the same for everyone. Everyone who lost a social security, in, Everyone whose social security number was picked up by a thief had the same experience. They don't want to hear about internal process violations. They want to hear about being safe from identity theft. There we go. Ooh. I don't like standing behind this because I feel like you're so distant. But this isn't working either. Ha. Huh. So. One of the things people are pretty good at are making contextual decisions. This is the ladies' jewelry market in Hong Kong. This is Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue. You can buy pearls at both of these places. One place is better in terms of credit card fraud than the other place. One place is better in terms of accurately representing whether or not pearls are natural pearls, whether or not they're, they're fresh water, right? Can you guess which one of those is more, you know, trustworthy? We have offline a lot of ways to identify resources as good or bad because we have a lot of context. Now, compare this. This is even more extreme. You know, at least those were both jewelry markets, right? This is a bank. This is, this is like somebody's machine in somebody's house that's owned, that is being manipulated by organized crime, right? And look at the difference here. Here's the difference, right? It says SunTrust Online, and the URL is different. But that's a decent, you've got to admit, checking space SunTrust is a pretty good phishing URL, right? At least they have a, I thought this was a fairly good phishing site. How are we going to solve this? Well, economics tells us that signaling is a way to solve this. Because what you have in Tiffany's and the Hong Kong jewelry market are a 